Good afternoon, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar at the Institute of uh, International and European Affairs in Dublin. We're particularly delighted to be joined today by Carlo Monticelli, the governor of the Council of Europe Development Bank, known as the CEB, which is part of the Council of Europe family. Ireland, as you may know, currently holds the six monthly presidency of the Council of Europe. And today's event is taking place on the eve of the CEB joint annual meeting, which will be held uh, in, in Ireland, uh, which makes it a rather special occasion on which to discuss the work of, of the bank. This webinar is part of the IIEA's Global Europe project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And despite the fact that the EU and the Council of Europe are two very distinct entities, even if sometimes confused by, by the less well-informed, there are many values shared between the CEB and the EU, including democracy, equality, the rule of law, uh, human rights, uh, uh, and work for refugees, which is a particular speciality. As a multilateral development bank, with an exclusively social mandate, the CEB actively promotes social cohesion and strengthens social integration in Europe. The bank has a long pedigree. It was established in 1956, a year before the Treaty of Rome establishing the EEC entered into force in 1957, uh, which was, of course, the, the predecessor of today's European Union. Considering the current context, social development has never been more needed in Europe and the role of the CEB is more relevant than ever. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. I think we're all pretty used to that by now, but you never know. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once uh, myself and the governor have finished our initial conversation. Uh, I should say that today's conversation and the question and answer session are both on the record. Additionally, I have to say it, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also, as you know, most of you I think are watching, uh, uh, we're live streaming today's discussion uh, and a very well warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Before we begin, uh, Paul Ryan, who is the Director of the International Finance and Climate D Division of the Department of Finance, uh, would like to say a few words of welcome. Paul, please. Hey, good afternoon to everybody. Delighted to be here. Delighted to meet my old friend, um, uh, Carlo Monticelli, the governor of the Council of Europe Development Bank. And um, we've just come back from a very uh, useful and interesting meeting with uh, Minister Donoghue. And indeed, the minister will be chairing the events over the next two days of, of the, the, the bank. Uh, the bank is one of our 15 multilateral development bank banks that Ireland is a member of. And this is the very first time we've had an annual meeting of any of these banks. So it's a, a, a very important occasion for us and a very valuable occasion. We really appreciate the decision by the, the bank to come here, postpone since 2020, and indeed see the governor here and, and all of the delegates over the next few days. Um, uh, the bank is Paris-based. It has 42 members and um, uh, 46 members in general in the Council of Europe. Uh, so for Ireland, two key points that we have. Number one, uh, the um, uh, SEB, as we call it, is uh, uh, one of the two multilateral development banks that provide funding to Ireland. The other one is European Investment Bank. And they have provided uh, close to a billion euros over the last seven years. It would be in areas social housing, education, health, very particular niche areas that the bank does an extremely good job, fantastic skills, fantastic expertise. We have a great relationship with them. The money goes directly to the government, uh, to local authorities and housing associations and the housing finance agency, et cetera. And the governor will go through some of that work in a minute. Uh, the second area then, for which is important to Ireland and, and the ministry here, is that it basically underpins the key message of European integration and social cohesion of the Council of Europe, which is really important for us, uh, pretty good with our presidency for six months. Uh, very important focus upon social infrastructure, social cohesion, and displaced persons, which gave, gave rise to its funding back in 1956 with the Hungarian uprising. And of course, refugees. It's done a lot of work in refugees from North Africa that the Department of Finance uh, provided uh, some funding uh, some six years ago. And also now, obviously, for Ukraine, uh, Minister Dunham, who has just announced that the establishment of a one million euro fund for uh, Ireland, Ukraine, and it's a kickstart, uh, much needed investment for uh, refugees and displaced persons in Ukraine and for some of the neighboring countries. Uh, we would hope that the meeting uh, will basically agree to membership of Ukraine for, for, for the bank. I think it's very important. And also that we'll then will make a lot of progress on a new capital increase for the bank to help 
Ukraine, uh, uh, in the country itself, and then in the neighboring countries as well going forward uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, the bank is, uh, I always joke with the governor, it's um, one of our best kept secrets of multilateral development banks, but the people who need to know, such as governments, refuge, refugee agencies, uh, financing agencies, know it very well and work very closely with it as well. So it's a very efficient bank. It's only 200 people, but a very large outreach. And as I say, in relation to refugees, displaced persons, does an excellent job and has a very heavy workload ahead in, in, in Ukraine in the next five years or 10 years or so. And uh, we have the utmost confidence in the governor and the, the, the uh, other people at the bank that it will do a very good job there. So delighted the governor's here, delighted that the annual meeting has been here for the next two years and look forward to his chat for the next hour. And thank you again. Over to you, governor. A few words of background about the governor before we start our conversation. So Carlo Monticelli was elected governor of the Council of Europe Development Bank on, in June 2020, having served for six years as vice governor for financial strategy. He began his five-year mandate in December of uh, last year. And before joining the bank, uh, Mr. Monticelli worked for more than a decade at the Italian Treasury, representing Italy in international fora and institutions, including the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So you are no stranger to this kind of work, Governor. And once again, welcome to Dublin and welcome to the Institute. Um, to kick off, can I ask you just to give us a sense of what you see as the role and the values of the, the Council of, of Europe Development Bank today? And what are your key priorities and goals at this point? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for having me uh, here. This uh, is uh, a key think tank for the debate uh, in Ireland, and I'm really proud to, to, be, to be here and have a chance uh, to discuss with you uh, what uh, the Council of Your Development Bank does uh, for uh, Ireland, uh, for social cohesion in Europe, and moving forward uh, for, uh, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the bank was uh, was established, as uh, uh, Paul Ryan was saying, six, six years ago to take care of refugees. And uh, then it has stuck to its mission throughout, throughout its life, uh, supporting integration and social cohesion uh, through projects uh, to, to this effect. And now uh, with uh, the refugee crisis uh, coming from the terrible war in Ukraine, uh, its values, the help that it can provide uh, uh, to refugees and internally displaced people are a mission that is as relevant as ever. Well, as you say, it's, it's perhaps a sad commentary on the current state of affairs that indeed the the issue of refugees in, in Europe, unfortunately, is as relevant in 2022 as it was in 1956. Um, how has the bank been able to respond to the war in Ukraine? And how will you deal not only with the with the refugees, but the, the, the longer term consequences of this horrible war? Well, one of the key features of the bank uh, is uh, its effectiveness and agility, possibly as a, as a result of this of its size. So we were among uh, uh, the first uh, uh, IFIs uh, to intervene on the ground, uh, supporting the refugees at the moment of emergency. And we did uh, that uh, also supporting the hosting community. Uh, now, uh, moving forward uh, we with the uh, accession of Ukraine, we will be able to operate in Ukraine itself providing immediate relief to internally displaced persons and uh, looking, uh, moving forward, thinking about the do daunting challenges of reconstruction, we will be there to help with our expertise, uh, which is focused on the key social sectors, health, education, and social housing. And there we have a particular expertise uh, to offer with skills that have been owned uh, during our intervention in the post-Yugoslavian war uh, environment. Uh, and so we, we believe that we have really something special to bring to the table of the international uh, effort to help Ukraine. 
Yeah. Practice. How do you how do you identify the projects? Do you do you rely on local authorities? Do you do that yourselves? How is the, how is the money dispersed? How does it? Well, for us, it's important to maintain an active and a focused dialogue with local authorities. At the end of the day, we do want our uh, projects to be owned by by the uh, by the authorities. Then, uh, once the the project is is well defined, uh, we are very quick uh, in defining a flexible financial structure that is going to meet the needs uh, of uh, the borrower, even from this point of view. And uh, mind you, we are very open to, in the type of borrowers we can serve. It can be central government, uh, local authorities, uh, uh, agencies uh, with a specific social mandate. Uh, and uh, we really interact uh, um, very closely with, 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 uh, with, with our counterparties. And this is where we see then sometimes uh, uh, the, this collaboration is very quick, very effective, because you need to be two to, to tango. And let me, let, let me say the projects uh, that uh, we had in Ireland uh, uh, really went very well because of the quality of the uh, administration and the quality of uh, people that, that we had uh, uh, the luck to interact with. In other uh, countries, challenges arose and uh, our ability to persevere in making sure that uh, projects are implemented right is one of, of the other achievements of the bank we are very proud of. And how, I mean, do governments or, or local authorities have to propose the projects? Uh, is, well, there, is, there, is, there a, is there a formal procedure? Yeah, or yeah, there... uh, um, I mean, the, um, the formal procedure is uh, you know, with a formal request going through the Council of Europe. But before getting there, uh, there is uh, the interaction uh, that uh, sometimes is quite quick because uh, the needs that come to us are already expressed in a well-defined process. Uh, other times, uh, uh, there is uh, the uh, process of making, uh, this is the jargon, to making the process bankable, so uh, the project bankable. Uh, I, no. but, but, uh, but I, and this uh, sometimes uh, uh, take uh, effort, take a joint effort, uh, especially to find uh, uh, ways uh, to mitigate the risk uh, that we can uh, uh, that we, we we can afford, because of course, especially when we have local authorities of borrowers uh, that, for some reason or another, do not benefit from state guarantee, then uh, uh, we have to find ways uh, to uh, arrange uh, the the, the so the. Uh, financial structure in a way that is mutually mutually viable. And uh, as I said, this uh, might take time, but uh, something that we are very proud of, especially, let me say, in comparison with our, uh, our uh, sister in institution, uh, so to speak, is the fact that we are uh, very, very flexible. I mean, let me uh, make you uh, an, uh, an example. You know, the way the um, capital is going to be paid. You know, you, you, of course, we offer the standard, uh, you know, linear, uh, standard installment uh, every every year but we are very flexible in having the different different structures with the grace period say to uh, meet the needs of a particular budget cycle and is it typically 100 percent funding or do you do you, uh, no, you co-finance co with actually uh... we have a standard limit of 50 percent okay this is standard across uh, uh, multilateral development banks uh, and so uh, uh, there is uh, uh, somebody co-financing, be it the borrower itself, or be it another, another multilateral. In some special circumstances, this uh, uh, percentage uh, can be lifted up to uh, 70 or 80 percent. And this is, what is indeed what happened during the COVID crisis. During the COVID crisis, uh, we uh, once again were 
very quick, very effective. We were, I would say, the very first uh, uh, institution to disburse. Uh, and uh, there, given the exceptionality of the, of the crisis, uh, we, we lifted uh, this percentage to, to 70 or even 80 percent. And, and what kind of projects were you funding related to the COVID crisis? Well, these were, of course, mainly in the health sector. Mm -hmm. And these there were really a wide range of uh, intervention. There were, in some cases, just uh, to finance the first purchase of uh, uh, emergency supply, uh, like uh, the equipment, equipment for nurses. Mm -hmm. But uh, then uh, it turned out uh, that uh, some of uh, uh, the basic infrastructure were deficient mm -hmm. and the crisis just showed that uh, so some uh, uh, medical equipment uh, was a finance and sometimes even the enlarging of hospital facilities indeed um paul mentioned and you've touched upon the work you do in ireland C can you can you give our audience a sense of what kind of projects you uh, you funded here well here we have a, a variety of of, of sector the um, most important one is the social housing sector. And uh, well, I, I don't need to tell this audience how important and political relevant is this, is this issue. And this is something where uh, we have put uh, a lot of, uh, of attention and effort. And uh, uh, I don't want to be boring, but it, it was really important uh, the quality of the interaction we uh, we had uh, in this type of projects to deliver and to deliver fast. We had then uh, uh, quite important uh, programs uh, in uh, supporting uh, um, employment and employment creation through the financing of small and medium enterprises and with this uh, we, we, we did this through the um, uh, national promotional national promotional bank, but then uh, we also had uh, uh, other other projects. For example, we uh, f uh, finance a prison. I mean, by the way, we are the only international financial institution that uh, uh, finances prisons, and this uh, uh, might might seem uh, uh, kind of an oddity, but instead it deeply resonates with the value of human rights mm. that must be upheld in any uh, circumstances that, that are uh, the, the founding values of the uh, Council of Europe, uh, um, which is ultimately our mother institution. Let's turn to another subject. Uh, there's much discussion in the banking world and particularly in the, the multilateral banking world about climate change, sustainability, uh, green finance. Uh, how is your bank? responding to these new challenges? Well, this is a very important challenge that, and uh, nobody can, can ignore it. But uh, we want to maintain, to, to maintain our focus on the social uh, sector. And this is the reason why we look at the issue of climate change uh, through the lens uh, of uh, the social climate nexus. Ooh, what do I mean? I mean that ultimately, if we look uh, at the consequences of climate change, uh, the most vulnerable are those who are going to suffer most. And we already see that. So uh, our idea is uh, to focus our intervention through this lens and then uh, consider the help we can provide uh, to, to this issue in any of our uh, of our projects. For example, uh, something that uh, we, we often do in various countries is uh, to finance uh, uh, the um, improvement uh, of public buildings, uh, schools, uh, just putting uh, you know, the anti-seismic safe. In that event, then, uh, we would finance uh, also the retrofitting to improve uh, uh, the the quality uh, of uh, in terms of energy efficiency yes. and thus giving uh, our our contribution. 
we are not the climate bank. We uh, would not uh, uh, say finance a uh, uh, field of sol solar panels. It is in our mandate, but uh, when assessing uh, the project to prioritize them, the contribution that they can give uh, uh, to the fight against climate change is certainly one of the top uh, uh, parameters that we, we refer to. You, you have worked extensively in your previous uh, Italian responsibilities with other uh, multilateral development banks. Uh, what kind of cooperation and coordination does the CEB have? I mean, we, we've mentioned uh, you know, the uh, European Investment Bank, which is the, the EU instrument, but uh, do, do you exchange views with the multilateral development banks more generally? Yeah, and, and... Absolutely. You know, we, we really want to be part of the club, so to speak. There is even an informal group that it is meeting uh, uh, twice per year, uh, at the margin of the Washington yes, uh, World Bank. I've, I've participated uh, in a few of those. Yeah. You know, the, it's called the ads of MDBs, and yes. this is yeah, it's an informal exchange. I mean, we had a, a joint uh, uh, press communique when the uh, war erupted to show our joint solidarity and our willingness to, uh, to cooperate. Uh, so there is a constant exchange of view that translate into joint operation and joint uh, collaboration on the field whenever it's appropriate and, and effective. There are cases in which the, the synergies are quite obvious, uh, just uh, going back to the uh, example of the 50% limit. They are, you know, it would be uh, important, it is important for the borrower to find a co-financer uh, and so we we collaborate uh, with uh, uh, other uh, other multilaterals uh, in in this. In other circumstances, is more parallel financing or finding uh, uh, the cooperation on uh, intervention that are in the same area, but using uh, uh, the different instruments that characterize uh, the institution. For example. The EBRD uh, as as a key instrument, uh, the participation in risk capital for uh, uh, you know, enterprises. We do not uh, we do not do equities, but yet, uh, say in the health sector, there might be there might be well projects with a high social value that would benefit uh, from. Uh, uh, synergistic intervention of loans and equities. And there, uh, we, we are uh, de de uh, delighted to, to, work, to go uh, to work together. And this uh, is indeed uh, what uh, I believe is going to happen in uh, the reconstruction uh, of, uh, of Ukraine, where uh, we are going to uh, first uh, cooperate in, ex in exchanging information, and then uh, on the field, uh, just according to the specific uh, to the specific uh, to the specific project. Of course, we can always look forward to the moment when we can talk seriously about reconstruction in Ukraine when when the, the war is the war is finished. But it is going to be a massive project when you look at the scale of the damage uh, which has been done. Of course, in the first instance, to to people and people killed and injured, but also. The whole prolific destruction of property and infrastructure. Uh, how will that be coordinated in terms of identifying the priorities and, and how to move forward? I mean, of course, the Ukrainian government, I suppose, will have its own ideas. But uh, uh, absolutely, I mean, I think that I mean the scale of the intervention are just mind-boggling. Uh, but uh, it is clear that certain key priority must be owned by Ukrainian people. So, you know, you say, uh, just uh, to give an, an example, there will be areas uh, that where people will not be able to just go back to their homes. Then uh, where will be uh, placed these uh, uh, people who cannot return to their homes? This is something. Uh, this is certainly a decision that is it is neither up to the Council of Europe Development Bank nor uh, to any other multilateral. It'll, it it will be 
the people, the government to decide. Uh, so this is a type of priority uh, that uh, we, we will uh, we will receive from uh, the, the the government. Then uh, there will be other areas of intervention that once again in broader terms uh, uh, will be indicated by the by the Ukrainian administration but finally there are areas uh, where the priorities uh, will be jointly determined through the uh, interaction of uh, the the views of the Ukrainian people and uh, our experience uh, in terms of effectiveness of certain type of intervention, uh, necessity to have a transparent process uh, in doing certain things. Uh, uh, so, all for in broader terms, first uh, the um, Ukrainian people, then a joint collaboration, and then uh, we will have uh, uh, to uh, roll up our sleeves and get the work done. It's it's a uh... I, I remember um, when the collapse of the, the Soviet Union and there was a lot of assistance offered in the first instance to Poland and Hungary. Uh, and I remember talking to several of the ministers in those countries saying they were overwhelmed with visits from well-intentioned uh, people from different member states, different countries, different banks. And they said they were slightly lost in, in trying to uh, figure out how to make all this work in the best, in the best way. So I, I, I imagine the, the system has improved a bit since those days. But... It, it is. At, at the same time, you see, uh, when uh, you have uh, uh, players with a far wider mandate than ours, then uh, for uh, a minister in charge, uh, it might be difficult to decide whether it's more urgent, uh, uh, electric grid uh, or uh, a motorway. We will be talking about... Uh, schools, uh, mm. hospital, and social housing. So in a way, uh, even from this point of view, the interaction with the Council of Europe Development Bank should be e e easier, so to speak. Great. I'm now going to turn to questions from our audience. I'll start with our live audience uh, uh, here in uh, 8th North Great Georgia Street, uh, who would like to ask the first question. Yes, please. You might like to introduce yourself, Jeff. Yeah. Wait, just wait one moment, Brian, till we get the um, the microphone. Sorry, I caught alert, caught loop by surprise there. Very good. Is that okay? So yeah, Brian Daly, I'm a board member here in the institute. Uh, thanks for your thoughts so far. Um, my question was two twofold, if I can. One are the is the financing provided on commercial terms uh, relative comparative to to other institutions. Um, and secondly, uh, the organization, as was referred to earlier, isn't exactly very well known. Um, is that an issue or do you think that's important for the organization to become better known so that the benefits of what the Council of Europe is doing through the Development Bank are actually better known in society or in, 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 the, in the countries in which the uh, funding is provided? Thank you for your question that uh, uh, you know, helped me to clarify two very important points. Uh, the first, the first one is uh, about uh, uh, the terms, uh, the financial terms of our loans. Uh, we benefit uh, from a very good rating, which allow allows us uh, to tap international financial uh, markets at uh, uh, very very low, and we transfer these uh, very low rates entirely to the borrower with just a minimal markup uh, to pay our electricity bill, so to speak. So uh, the, uh, our loans uh, tend uh, to be well, well below uh, market rates that countries uh, would face if they were to uh, borrow directly. Uh, being little known is a big issue. I mean, the way the way I see it, uh, he, okay, we are uh, a well-hidden secret, but you know, we see it. To be a little known certainly is not uh, is not good for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's frustrating uh, not uh, to have enough people appreciating the good work that we do. It's also 
uh, sometimes you know clipping the wing of potential collaboration because just uh, people don't know that good uh, and uh, I mean this is certainly one of my priorities uh, to, to go uh, move, to go ahead uh, uh, in my you know in my tenure uh, as a government. So I'm wor working on it. Kim. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Fitzgerald. I'm a researcher here at the IEA. I'm um, hoping you might indulge two questions, if that's okay. No, no, so no it's a bit question... cheeky, but we'll, we'll, okay, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you we'll let you get away with it. So the first question I had, which is about the effects of the Syrian refugee crisis on social cohesion in Europe. And I was wondering if Mr. Mr. Monticelli had, um, had, if there were any specific lessons that we could have learned from, if the CEB has learned any specific lessons from what happened with the Syrian refugee crisis. And my second question is, um, with the reconstruction of Ukraine, how will the CEB balance the need for a quick reconstruction with the need for um, transparency and accountability, especially since corruption is a known issue in Ukraine? Thank you. Okay, well, challenging question, and <laughs> like, like all good, good questions are. Um, now, we learn a lot from the refugee crisis. And uh, I think the two were the key lessons. Well, the first one is that when you have a refugee crisis, you need uh, to be careful in providing what refugees need, not what you think they need. And uh, from this point of view, our partnership with the IOM was uh, really, really crucial. This is where we started. To, to work closely together. They have been uh, in, uh, instrumental to have our grants being spent being spent well in a good in a good way and indeed they are uh, really our uh, major partners now in the uh, in the Ukrainian refugee refugee crisis. Um, the second lesson important that we learned is that, uh, uh, to facilitate uh, uh, integration, the acceptance on a longer term of the inflows of refugees and migrants, it is absolutely important to make the social investment that is needed to ease the strain on uh, uh, social services mm -hmm. of the hosting community. So you have. Um, refugees that are most welcome. Then when people realize that as a result of the number of refugees, they have to queue for longer in the emergency room of the local hospital, well, so it is important to just to uh, bring up the standard, the, um, the social infrastructure. And the second question about uh... Uh, you corrupt, corruption and oh uh, yes oh, sorry yeah you're right uh, now uh, this is something uh, where I hope uh, we can really provide uh, value added banking on the experience that we had in the Western Balkans after the uh, Latin war where we had uh, to deal uh, with uh, um, projects in countries uh, with a limping governance. So let me put it this way. And there, uh, we've learned to be perseverant and to stick on our guns in making sure that certain rules, especially about procurement, are met. Otherwise, money are not dispersed. As simple as that. And this my, my, might seem trivial, but it's not, it is not at all. Uh, and uh, alas, in some cases, led to delays in the implementation of the projects uh, uh, that are, alas, very sad because it is uh, the population, the beneficiaries of the project that are suffering. 
but I think uh, that this was an important contribution to uh, have people understand uh, the importance of following uh, the rules of, uh, of transparency, the rule, uh, the rule of law. And I think that this uh, has uh, uh, done a lot to enhance our reputation in the international, international community just for our perseverance in making sure that uh, uh, no corners are cut with respect to certain basic, basic rules of transparency and accountability. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Barry. And thank you, Governor Monticelli. It's great that you're here with us at the IIA. I have a, a quick question, but I think it will afford a, it's not a straightforward answer. Beyond what you've spoken about by way of crises, so things like the atrocious war in Ukraine and climate change, what are some of the other major challenges that the bank is currently grappling with that perhaps you think citizens and policymakers should be thinking about more? Indeed, are, are there any such examples? Well, you see, the uh, social cohesion is at the heart of democracy. Let, let, let me put it so bluntly and directly. And uh, it is uh, threatened, uh, particularly in this moment uh, of a post-COVID uh, recovery that has enhanced uh, social inequalities, especially in uh, the access uh, uh, to basic uh, social uh, services. Think uh, about uh, the digital divide, which uh, implied that uh, as a result uh, of the uh, distant learning during the lockdowns, you had disadvantaged, disadvantaged uh, uh, children who simply did not have a well-functioning computer at home, they became even more disadvantaged because they might have lost two, two, two years of school. And I am I'm making this a concrete example, but this kind of uh, uh, issue really are uh, covering very, very many, very many areas. And this is where uh, fulfilling our mandate uh, can really make, uh, make the difference directly in uh, supporting the most vulnerable and indirectly through this uh, support uh, in uh, giving a concrete contribution uh, to cope uh, with uh, the political challenge of stopping uh, the populism. Because at the end of the day, once again, uh, the uh, I mean, you have in political science, as you know, very many differences, uh, uh, sorry, very many de definitions of populism. But uh, uh, the characteristic is uh, to give falsely simple answers to very difficult questions. And uh, to avoid uh, this uh, temptation to go to false and simple, uh, answer some basic uh, needs uh, must be met, uh, and this is where the bank uh, can help. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, Mary McCaughey, I'm from the EU agency, which is based here in, in, in Ireland, Eurofund. And just to follow on a little bit from Barry's question, uh, we actually serendipitously uh, launched the results of our most recent survey uh, across the European Union. And one of the main findings from that survey, which has been looking over the last two years, um, is that trust in institutions across the European Union has really plummeted during this period, during the pandemic, and now, of course, uh, during uh, the period of the, the war. And I suppose really speaking a little bit to the social cohesion, um, what would you say we could do to, to try and boost trust, to improve those levels of trust? Because that plays very much into what you've just been discussing there about the polarization of society, social unrest, unrest disengagement, um, all of the things that we are working 
towards trying to address uh, when we talk about social cohesion? Uh, I mean, this uh, question would uh, require a very articulated uh, and difficult uh, uh, reply, difficult from a political point of view, uh, because uh, uh, ultimately you need political leadership to let uh, people understand that uh, certain issues uh, are, are difficult uh, and require uh, uh, deploying very many policy instruments. But the simple answer that I would give uh, is uh, to, to get back trust. The answer is uh, for the institutions and the political system to deliver. Deliver, deliver. At the end of the day, if we go, if we look at the across uh, uh, political system and electoral system, we see that uh, whenever you have uh, uh, the electoral system, or uh, if you will, the voting system that uh, really is uh, uh, focusing on what uh, uh, somebody in office uh, has delivered. Well, then citizens see what they got and see what they didn't get. Now, again, according to the scale of the problem, uh, Delivering, delivering in a in a clear way becomes uh, more difficult. But this is where the art of politics, uh, let's call it this way, comes in. Because clearly, uh, in many cases, there are also conflicting priorities, and this is where uh, a mediation has to come. But a mediation that uh, is. Uh, uh, you know, the compromise that, as they say, makes uh, everybody unhappy, but uh, everybody can live. Let me give you two questions from our online audience, um, which I think are sort of related. So Sarah Blake uh, asks the following. It appears that there is almost an infinite list of projects which the Council of Europe Development Bank could be asked to address, from offering assistance to displaced persons to funding social housing. How does the bank choose between projects? all of which are urgent and greatly needed. Is there a values-based reference framework which it applies? And then Duran O'Brien from the Department of Foreign Affairs asks, and this is, I think, related, will the bank's upcoming focus on Ukraine detract from the bank's ability to continue funding essential projects in other member states? Okay, let, let, let me take the, the, the first question. We do, uh, have a system of uh, scoring, internal scoring, uh, a core, uh, about uh, the uh, impact that our project can, can give. And this has uh, metrics have, have, having to do with the social impact, with the climate change, with uh, uh, the contribution that it gives uh, to uh, gender gender equality. So this is quite a, a powerful uh, a powerful way to establish priorities. Then uh, another important uh, uh, element uh, is uh, for a bank to have a balanced portfolio in terms of risk and. Uh, also geographical dispersion. I mean, um, one uh, of uh, the tenets of, uh, uh, of banking uh, is uh, to, make, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, risk is diversified. Mm. Uh, and this uh, is uh, something that, of course, uh, we, we, must, uh, we must follow and, and we do. Uh, so the... Uh, Prioritizing is, uh, uh, in a way, when, when these uh, two uh, guidelines are followed, is not that difficult. Mm. Uh, clearly, what uh, is uh, difficult, and we go back to the second resource, is you know, where, where you draw the line. Uh, and this, uh, of course, depends on the uh, size of our financial resources. And this is why, as uh, 
Mr. Ryan was uh, uh, saying at the beginning, we are in the process uh, uh, of uh, discussing to our shareholder the need to shore up uh, uh, our capital endowment uh, to be able to make sure that uh, our meaningful engagement uh, with the Ukraine, uh, the reconstruction, the refugees uh, that uh, will stay outside Ukraine, that this uh, uh, essential engagement does not uh, crowd out uh, uh, other important projects, uh, doesn't crowd out our contribution to the social cohesion uh, in our member states. Do you have a quota system? Is there a, a, a limit how, how, or guaranteed amounts for each each, mem each member of the Council of Europe, or is it um, is it balanced you, out over time? But uh, what do you mean in terms of a contribution to the capital share? No, no, no. Well, I, I might be interested to hear about the contribution. I imagine that that is some kind of key. Yeah, but, absolutely. But, but yeah. Uh, I'm thinking more in terms of receiving funds. No, no, no. I mean, we do not have a, a system of quotas at all. I mean, if you look and compare, uh, you know, the uh, quota in capital and the quota in, in the portfolio, uh, they might be quite, quite different. Mm. Uh, so the uh, balance uh, is uh, more about uh, uh, risk divers diversification and also on uh, on the basis on the basis of demand. Uh, and this is anyhow something that applies over time. So it is really quite rare that we just say, no, this is this is impossible. Uh, especially because uh, where we are already have large exposures, as a result of having la large exposure, we have also have uh, a large reflows. Mm. Uh, so, you know, with the reflows, with the giving back, uh, uh, um, the, the the capital borrower these uh, frees up uh, resources uh, uh, to be to be reinvested in the very same country the council of europe is probably best known for the for the human rights and the european court and uh Dieran o'brien again from dfa department of foreign affairs has asked uh, does the um the bank have funding to try to complement the work of the European Court of Human Rights in member states, for example, granting loans or improving judicial institutions? Oh, we do, we do in this, but uh, uh, this is uh, where um, we want to see the, the uh, ownership of countries uh, in uh, implementing these values. So I was uh, uh, quoting uh, the case of uh, uh, prisons uh, before, and uh, you know the, the importance of uh, making sure that uh, the, the human rights are respected even in these circumstances. We do have uh, uh, funds uh, available, and this is uh, one of our priorities indeed, uh, uh, to support uh, uh, the amelioration of uh, uh, just buildings uh, where uh, justice, uh, the justice process that takes, uh, uh, takes, takes place. Um, but uh, it, you know, it is quite important, and uh, I mean, with uh, some of the uh, colleagues in the Council of Europe, uh, uh, you know, some, sometimes I have to, to make uh, uh, this point quite, quite clearly that, you know, we are a bank. We give uh, very good terms about money that are to be given back in very exceptional circumstances in crisis time. We do offer grants, but uh, we are not a, a grant uh, uh, giving institution because uh, we have uh, to make uh, uh, profits that make us uh, sustainable and most importantly, uh, just uh, contribute to increase our capital base which is necessary to increase the scale of our uh, of our of our operations so indeed uh, uh, we can be an instrument of uh, implementation of the values of the council of europe how much uh, we do that ultimately depends on the uh, on the uh, on the borrowers that maybe leads to another question from uh, uh, online, which asks, is there a conditionality mechanism attached to recipient loans 
by the um, by the bank, uh, such as it was done by the EU with Poland to help to make sure that uh, the fostering of and respect of democratic values. Uh, we do not have any macro conditionality. Uh, we are not the World Bank. We are not the European Union. We have uh, a very strict conditionality related to the specific project we finance. So we do not finance budget. We do not finance the country, the local authorities. We finance the growth. Mm. And we want to make sure that the money are spent for that particular for that particular project. And this, uh, we have uh, uh, an effective system uh, uh, to make sure that this is the case. And, you know, so, um, it is not uh, necessarily, you know, cumbersome, that is not bureaucratic, but effective, really to make sure that money go where they were supposed to go. Very good. Um... We have a question here from one of our researchers, Alex Conway, who wants to ask, how does the uh, Council of Europe Development Bank ensure their project's credentials are really as green as they claim to be and to avoid greenwashing? Okay, um, well, this, uh, okay, uh, we have uh, in our team of experts, engineers that would look, uh, would look, uh, would look at, uh, uh, at these, uh, green credential to make sure that uh, the project has the as green as they claim uh, as they claim to be but more more generally um i would just want to flag the point that uh, uh, for us uh, uh, the uh, the department of uh, technical assistance and monitor monitoring plays a quite important role uh, both ex ante in uh, making sure that uh, the project we finance are high impact and exposed to uh, see that projects were uh, just implemented, they were uh, supposed to. And notwithstanding our small size, we do have uh, uh, an evaluation office which uh, would uh, then when the project is concluded and it has deployed its effect, uh, do a kind of a post-mortem to make sure that uh, what uh, it was promised to deliver, it has been delivered, so as to learn lessons for, uh, for the future. Uh, so we do, uh, we do have these systems in place, and given that you you are talking about greenwashing and uh, also social washing, uh, let me move, move for a moment on the uh, other side of the balance sheet of our liability side, because we do not issue green bonds, uh, but we do issue uh, sus uh, sustainable bonds in the terms of social inclusion bonds mm -hmm. that are bonds uh, that are of the sustainable family. And uh, uh, make sure that uh, the proceeds raised with these issuance uh, are uh, going to finance a, a project that are social inclusion. Now, to do that, uh, we have uh, duties uh, uh, of reporting our our activities uh, uh, that uh, follow the the rules of the International Association of ICMA. And uh, I am very proud uh, to say that the quality of our reporting is uh, much higher than uh, what other issuers do because of our process of, of selection, because of the greenwashing and uh, social washing uh, is, is also happening on the uh, liability side with many issuers uh, claiming that uh, you know, their bonds are green. Do you have failed projects? Do you claim money back? Uh, no, we just uh, cancel projects, which are, or we interrupt projects. And uh, this this happened, this has happened. Uh, it is uh, disappointing. It is frustrating, uh, but we believe it that uh, uh, it is uh, sometimes unavoidable. And it is necessary to establish uh, uh, to establish credibility. 
we have, uh, and this is, I mean, I like you, you mentioned, uh, we have an incredibly good track record in terms of repayments. Uh, you know, all uh, multilateral development banks, because of their preferred credit to stages, have uh, uh, very, very good, uh, uh, you know, repayment, mm -hmm. uh, much, much larger yeah. than commercial banks. This is quite na natural. But for us, it's really quite amazing. You know, in the uh, years uh, of our life, uh, we have uh, issued some 65 billion in nominal terms. And over 60 years a year, this amount of money, we had only one impairment uh, for 1 million to an Icelandic bank uh, that was AAA at the time when we, <laughs> so, but apart from that, uh, never. So, you know, imagine it's a zero and you need very many other zeros before you, you reach the one. <laughs> That's very impressive. Um, I, I see another question from, from Brian. Governor, I'd just be interested, uh, you'll be talking generally uh, specifically about the, the Council of Europe uh, Development Bank, and we've referred to other development agencies. Um, if you had uh, the capacity to kind of look at the way in which they're operating and recommend changes to the mandates, the scale, the way they operate, the way they interact, in light of the global ch challenges that have emerged in, in the last number of years, are there things do you think that need to be done with the development agencies or within the development agencies in order to make a step change? Or are they actually largely delivering pretty much to their mandates and the mandates are fine? I mean, this uh, is uh, um, a very well question, which uh, has to be ultimately answered by shareholders. And we have had uh, in the G20, a group uh, that has been exactly doing that. You know, looking at the mandate, looking at uh, the efficiency of use of capital resources, uh, the, war, the work is undergoing. Uh, something that uh, shareholders in general um, want all the time is more coordination, more, more effectiveness. Uh, and uh, to improve coordination is, uh, if you will, a never-ending, never-ending challenge. Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, if uh, we step back one second and look uh, at uh, the development uh, in the last uh, fifteen years uh, or ten years, uh, multilateralism has uh, uh, received uh, very many challenges. Uh, in multilateral development banks, I believe, uh, have been a bulk work of multilateralism showing that uh, institution, multilateral institution, can deliver, and they do. Now you're asking, could I have delivered more? Of course, yes, they, they can always deliver more, uh, but, uh, do I see major pitfalls that require uh, an immediate redressing? Frankly not. And indeed, if I look uh, at the result uh, of that uh, study, uh, of course, there are uh, important, useful uh, direction, guidance, uh, but nothing is really requirement and overall of, of, uh, of the system. So the only grade has not uh, been reached yet, but I think that uh, all in all, the, the multilateral development banks are uh, moving in the right direction. And uh, the model has been, must have been successful because if you will look at the great financial crisis, we had a rebalancing of global power in various ways and uh, an offspring of the great financial crisis has been the creation of uh, yet other two uh, development banks, the new development banks and Asian infrastructure investment bank. So after all, this type of business model, this type of, of uh, institution 
must not be too bad. That's a very good note. On which to end, Governor. We've run out of time. Uh, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us uh, the work of the bank and your thoughts on its future development. We wish you a successful meeting tomorrow uh, and a, a successful mandate over the next five years. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much for having me. It has really been a pleasure to exchange uh, uh, with such a distinguished audience in presence and uh, from remote. And, and thank you for those who joined us online. Thank you very much. Thank you.